Hi there, this is Nicole Dyer at Family Locket. And for today's video, we have a topic of increasing genealogy productivity with artificial intelligence. And I taught about this in our recent Research Like a Pro online course, Office Hours. And so this is an excerpt from that Office Hours presentation where I talk about this um, idea that we can increase our productivity by using artificial intelligence generative text tools like ChatGPT, Claude, and Gemini. So follow along as I go through all of the steps in the Research Like a Pro process and how we can use AI tools at each step of the process in order to be more effective and efficient with what we're doing in our genealogy research. Our first section for tonight is about our monthly theme, which is the productivity lesson. And I decided to focus in on the hot new topic that everyone's working on and thinking about. Well, not everyone, but a lot of us. <laughs> artificial intelligence tools, specifically the large language models. So what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about these and then show how they can help make us more productive and more efficient and some of the work we're doing in research like a pro in each step. So what are these artificial intelligence tools for productivity? Well, the large language models that um, are really popular right now, like ChatGPT are a type of generative AI where they can predict the next tokens, which are parts of words. And they've gotten so good that they can, and they've been trained on so much data, they can predict not just the next words or the next part of your sentence, but they can write full sentences and paragraphs and complete essays and books. So they are really good at generating text. The AI tools have existed for a long time, but Recently, they have, you know, discovered that if you give a lot of feedback from humans to the machines, they learn and they get better. So they become useful for doing all kinds of things beyond just predicting the next tokens, but they are useful now for writing tasks, processing different types of writing and transforming it in different ways, generating drafts for our paragraphs or sentences, titles, different things, and then suggesting things that you can do. And those are just a few ideas. The three large language models that I am going to refer to today are the ones here, ChatGPT, which was created by OpenAI, and Claude by Anthropic, and the new Gemini by Google. These are the ones that I've found are the most useful for me and the type of things that we're doing in Research Like a Pro. Now, just a couple warnings about these large language models, and you've probably heard this, but they can hallucinate, which means they make things up. And that's because they're machines. They don't actually know anything. They're, they're not humans with knowledge. They've just been trained on data. So they, they're machines that can predict things and they want us, they want to give us what we want to hear. And so if we ask for something that it can't really do, it will still try to give us that thing and attempt to please us. So we need to be the human in the equation, as Steve Little says, says from the NGS AI class, and fact check the output. And just remember that they are not search engines, although some of the large language models are beginning to have some capabilities for that. But they're not search engines for the internet. Don't type into a large language model what you type into Google, but you can um, do some other things with them. Something to be aware of is that it's because the large language models have been trained on other text in the internet and other open um, copy, uh, like open source books and things that are in the public domain, um, then because they've been trained on that, they might give you a sentence or a paragraph that is actually the ideas and even the wording of someone else. So it can produce text that is actually copyrighted. And so we just need to be aware of that. And one thing that I've learned to do is to provide my own writing and then say, take this and make it simpler or make it sound this way. And so instead of just asking it to produce from nothing, you know, if you're writing an essay or something or a report, you want to give it something to work from. Um, and then the last point that has come up in the last few months, whenever I've been teaching about writing with AI tools is do we need to disclose that we've used a large language model to help us write something and kind of the conclusion I've come to for myself. And I think to help us all follow genealogy standards, I think we should disclose when we've used an 
LLM tool to generate writing. It's different if you're using it to proofread something you've already written, but if you're using it to generate the sentences and paragraphs, then definitely we should disclose that. We don't want to take credit for work we didn't do. And that's part of genealogy standards. And um, also we don't want to take credit for work we didn't do. That doesn't sound like us. It sounds silly or machine like, or impersonal or wordy the way that these things can kind of sound. So yes, they can do a lot, but we also don't want them to take over our unique voice and our style. All right. So let's start with the first research like a pro step. So it's a research objective. Um, one way that you can get help with your research objective from a, an AI tool is to take your timeline from um, whatever online tree you use, family search or ancestry, copy and paste that into one of these tools. This is chat GPT 3.5, the free one. And then just ask it to write a narrative from your timeline. And then as you read the output that you, you get, you can get ideas for things that need to be researched. And that's what happened with me. I wanted to make a story about my ancestor, Elam Hollingsworth. I put the timeline in and it, I put it into Gemini by Google and it gave me back this story. And it said, Elam Hollingsworth was born in 1838 into a Quaker family. And so right away I thought, okay, I don't know if he was born into a Quaker family. It didn't say that in my timeline. It just said that he was born into a community called Quaker in Vermilion, Indiana. So it, first of all, hallucinated because it made up or it inf made an inference that wasn't exactly true. But then I realized um, I knew Elam Hollingsworth's ancestors were Quaker, but I didn't know if he was, I knew that he was Campbellite later in his life. So that was a new research objective then. And I actually went and did that research right then and figured it out. But this is something that can help us get ideas of what we need to fact check and research and opportunities for further rounding out the lives of our ancestors. All right. The next is timelines. So when you're gathering all the starting point information and putting it into a timeline at the start of your project, um, if you're like me, you might have some deeds or things that you've transcribed that are long and you don't want to put all of that information in your timeline, but you kind of want to have a summary. Well, large language models are really good at summarizing text. So if you have a transcription, here's the prompt you could do. You are an expert genealogist. Create an abstract of this transcription by removing boilerplate text from this deed and preserve all names, dates, and places and details that make this deed unique. Do not editorialize or add anything. ChatGPT is notorious for editorializing and just adding all these sentences and being very wordy. So I just wanted a simple abstract. So I pasted that and then it gave me a deed abstract, which I'll show you in a minute, but it's good to give the LLM a role. That's why I said you're an expert genealogist because it activates its neural network for that topic you're asking about and then providing the text. So I provided the deed, um, will reduce the errors that it gives you in the output. So here's the deed abstract, much easier to digest. It's got the date, the grantor and the grantee, the property conveyed listed out there, the obligations and conditions and special provisions. So it just puts things in a really easy to digest way. It's good for summarizing. And so then I can paste that abstract right into my timeline here. So scrolling down, here's where I pasted the timeline or sorry, the abstract from ChatGPT into my timeline. Okay, on to source citations. So how can a large language model help with this? Well, if you provide the information needed for the citation, then ask it to generate one for you, then it can do a pretty good job with that. And so if you kind of know the elements that you need and give that to it, it will put it together for you. If you don't really know the elements needed, then it's just going to try to make one up for you. So you have to be really careful with the citations, but this is something I've written about. And so you can read my blog post if you're interested in learning more. Locality research. I chose Google Gemini for this um, experiment. And that's because it is kind of merged with Google's search capabilities. And so it does have some links and can search the web a little better than some of the others. So you can ask for help with learning about a location. I asked for help learning about Granger County, Tennessee and suggestions for resources. And so it linked me to the TSLA, which is, I am glad it did. That's a great resource and give me some other ideas. 
One thing that's great about Gemini is that at the bottom of the response, you can click the G Google search button to double check the response. And then it goes through and tries to find sources for all of these sentences and tells you if any of them are unsourced. All right, research planning, how can it help us with that? Well, if you upload your timeline and ask for suggestions for next steps, then it can do that. So it gave me some ideas for possible next steps on my John Robert Dyer research. Um, find his exact birth date and place, and investigate his parents and siblings. His marriage record is missing. Barshi with our background is missing. Death records or obituaries for either of the couple. Now, if I would have provided my objective, which is to find number two, maybe those suggestions could have been more tailored toward that objective. Research logs. This is exciting because Airtable, which is the tool we teach about and the one we like to use, recently announced that they do have AI tools within it. So if you add a new field for um, long text, you can turn on generate text, and then the AI will use it, the things in that row to generate um, information for you in long text format. So you tell it what you want it to do. You put the prompt here, and then you can have it generate that. Now it does require that you be on the paid Airtable plan, which is pretty pricey for us genealogists, $24 a month. And if you pay annually, it's cheaper per month. And this gives you a 500 credit AI preview. And you can use up those credits pretty quickly if you have long text here, if you have like more than 2000 words, I think it is in the prompt and the response. Um, so you might have to buy this add-on and if you're using it a lot but it might be really useful for you. So I just asked it to summarize the transcription, just like I had done earlier. And so I can paste my transcription there and then have the abstract or summary right there. So speaking of transcriptions, we all know that Family Search has done their full text search uh, experiment or lab where the deeds and probate records for the US are now full text searchable, which is amazing. Um, so how can we use that to help us? Can we also have AI transcribe things for us? As I've experimented with this, I found that yes, um, it can do that. And some of the advanced uh, models are pretty good at it. If you subscribe to chat GPT 4.0, it allows you to upload images and I've asked it to transcribe it. Here's an example. I told it the names because I thought those might be hard. I could read the names pretty well. I just didn't want to go to the trouble of transcribing all these boilerplate words, but I kind of wanted to have it <laughs> transcribed. So I asked it to go ahead and do it for me and it did a pretty good job. It got the name of the clerk wrong. So I said, oh, the name of the clerk is actually James H. Vance, not S. James N. Keener. I think that part says I, James H. Vance. So then it fixed it and updated it. If you don't want to pay for ChatGPT4, you can use Claude by Anthropic, which can read uploaded images on the free version. And then, oh, here's what it looked like in Claude when I uploaded it. And I even gave it the name of the clerk this time. And at first it just kind of gave me some information that looked wrong. Like William wasn't the son of Susanna, but then it did go ahead and transcribe it correctly. So that was weird. Just one of those silly things that it does. And then I wanted to mention Transcribus or Transcribus. Um, this is a tool at transcribus.org. You can create a free account. You can upload a document. Here's a deed that I had and it finds the lines and it can transcribe the lines. And then if you don't, if you see that it's incorrect, you can update it here and then you can copy and paste it into your document. So this is an amazing tool that we have access to now. Anyone can get a free account at Transcribus and try it out. So they have a lot of different languages and it was originally developed in Europe for different European archives there. So these are some of the different language models that they have available for recognizing handwritten text. And you can look at their website to see all the different ones, but you can see there's, it's not just English. There's all kinds of European languages, also Spanish. The CER stands for character error rate. So when you're choosing the model, you can look at the error rate and try to choose one with a low error rate. The more, the better models are part of their subscription. So you can use some models for free and then some of their specialized ones that are better, um, you have to subscribe. And then how can we use AI for report writing? 
Well, there's a couple of ways I've tried doing it. Um, I've tried generating an entire report just from my research log. And after a lot of practicing and trying different things, I was able to do that. Um, I had to give a really long detailed prompt with examples though. Otherwise it just sounded silly. Um, but then one thing that I did find that was pretty easy to do is to generate the summary of the findings, which is the results summary. And so that was great. I also, um, got it to do, oh, this example is about the conclusion. So I wanted it to write my conclusion for me because I already wrote about all the findings and now I wanted to just skip the step of writing the conclusion and it did a pretty good job, but then it missed, um, some things. So I had to tell it, okay, go back and make sure that you, um, include this part. And this is how I did the results summary. I told it to do a bulleted list with action verbs about everything that I found, because often for our clients, we'll put a results summary like this at the very top of the report so they can quickly see what, what has been done. So this was the first list, but I didn't like how it was worded. I, I told it to rewrite it with the action verbs at the front. So if you want to learn more about researching like a pro with AI, we just announced that we're doing a summer workshop on this. So we just wanted to share that with you that we'll be doing this if you're interested in AI stuff. So that's available on our website now.